Seldom does a single event manage to leave its imprint on such a broad swath of the public debate. But the tragic shooting in Tucson plunged the nation and its elected leaders into a week of soul searching that touched on the law, the limits of dispute, the protections offered by the Second Amendment, and heartbreakingly human stories of life, death, and the thin line that separates the two. As so often happens in these cases of focused national attention and grief, it fell to the President of the United States to weave those themes together. Rather than pointing fingers or assigning blame, let's use this occasion to expand our moral imaginations, to listen to each other more carefully, to sharpen our instincts for empathy, and remind ourselves of all the ways that our hopes and dreams are bound together. President Obama's appeal to the moral imagination won praise across the political spectrum. In an opinion piece posted today in the Washington Post, Arizona Republican Senator John McCain called it a terrific speech. We are Americans and fellow human beings, he wrote, and that shared distinction is so much more important than the disputes that invigorate our noisy, rough-and-tumble political culture. That is what I heard the president say on Wednesday evening, he said. I commend him and thank him for it. So, Dan, with statements like that and statements from John McCain, who, of course, was very quiet all week, does that mean we've reached this new moment of national comity? Well, Gwen, I, I would put it a different way. I think that Tucson has caused the whole country, individually and collectively, to kind of hit the pause button. Um, <clears throat> when something like this happens, I think it's natural for people to look at a lot of different aspects the role of guns in society, how we treat people with mental illnesses. Uh, and certainly this week, one aspect of that has been how we conduct the political discourse that we use in our democracy. Um, I think people are hopeful that this will bring some change, but I think we have to keep it in perspective. I mean, after 9-11, 9-11 changed everything, quote unquote. Uh, and for a time, there was a great period of national unity. Um, that quickly gave way to deep partisan polarization, and, and I think we have to be prepared for some of that to reemerge. I mean, the, the, the differences in this country politically are very deep, uh, and they're very heartfelt, and sometimes they get expressed in ways that uh, are over the top, and I think that we're at that moment where everybody individually is going to kind of say, well, how, how can I do what I normally do, but do it in a little softer volume? But I think, I think the jury's out as to whether there's going to be any real permanent change as a result of this. Janet, it felt like on the Hill, they were reaching for the right tone, trying to figure out how do you continue with the, the seriously held disagreements you have with the, other, the other's party, and yet express grief for a colleague, concern for oneself. There are a lot of things were going on. Yeah, uh, I mean, it was in Congress that they really hit the pause button. Um, the Republicans had planned this week to be the first week of the new Republican majority in the House, and they were going to have their cornerstone vote on Wednesday to repeal President Obama's health care bill. Um, and they suspended the regular business, put that off until next week, and they had one day of, of debate, debate on a resolution honoring the victims of the tragedy, and um, and Gabby Giffords. And it was actually a really unusual debate. It was like six hours scheduled, uh, and um, you know, dozens and dozens, hundreds of members spoke. And it was so unlike a typical House debate in that it was, it was very heartfelt. It kind of reminded you that Congress is, in addition to being a legislative body, a community. A lot of people know Gabby Gifford and express their connections to it. Um, I think the bigger challenge isn't what they did in, this week. It's what they do next week. And I'm skeptical that it'll have too much lasting impact on the nature of the debate, say, over the health care bill. Because, I mean, that is a deeply felt, felt policy difference that, I mean, you can express your opposition in terms that are more civil than what happened in the campaign or when, you know, congressional offices were being vandalized or, you know, some member of Congress had his electricity cut off after he um, voted for the bill. So, you know, we'll see next week. I don't expect the political dynamics to change, but, you know, at least for one week, maybe we'll see a softer tone. We've heard both uh, uh, Speaker John Boehner and, and President Obama, Chuck, use exactly the same verbiage, which was, we can disagree without being disagreeable, and then disagreeability usually ensues. Uh, <laughs> is that a word? <laughs> so what do we see happening here? Do we see disagree disagreement becoming 
respectful again, or do we just lapse back into where we were? If I, if I had to guess, Gwen, I would say we're going to lapse back, and that's partly based on history. Dan mentioned 9-11, uh, same thing after the Oklahoma City bombing in 1995. Within that same year, we had such a, a, a impasse between the, the parties that the government shut down. Um, one thing that's ha happening is that Congress, and especially the House, is just becoming more and more partisan. And, and you know, years ago, you, you had some uh, conservatives in the Democratic Party from the South. You had some liberals and definitely moderates in the Republican Party, mainly from the Northeast. Almost all those people have been defeated now. The realignment of the parties is virtually complete. And this last election, you had uh, 60, uh, some uh, Democrats lose their seats. The great majority of those were the so-called blue dog uh, uh, Democrats, uh, moderates. So now you have a, a Democratic caucus. It's smaller, of course, but it's also more liberal. It's more solidly liberal. And the Republican ca caucus is very conservative. And, and for those reasons, you have these systemic reasons that are making it harder and harder for this comity to take, to take place. Every president seems to have this moment where all eyes turn to him and they say, please heal us or speak to us. How did President Obama rise to that occasion? Well, I mean, it, it is interesting that the role of mourner in chief, if you will, is, is now part of the, the contemporary job description for the president. It was not always. Was not always. I mean, you can go back to Lincoln at Gettysburg as a moment in which the president did that, but, but we, don't, we never thought of it so much. And I think in some ways it was Reagan after the Challenger disaster uh, that, that kind of began that and people began to look to presidents uh, to do that. Um, I thought this was an, an important moment for uh, President Obama. He was able to deliver what in essence was a political message to the country, which was to let us step back, let us cool, let us seek our better angels. But he did it in a way that was basically shorn of partisanship, I thought. And, and I think that's one of the reasons that he has gotten praise across the political spectrum for, for what he was able to do. I mean, he, he used the tragedy and particularly the victims, and in particular the nine-year-old Christina mm -hmm. Taylor Greene, to, to say, let us live up to what she believed this country was and could be. And, and I think that that was effective. Uh, I think the other thing to say about him is that, I mean, it's been written a lot since the speech that, that this echoed themes of his 2008 campaign. And in a way, this was the kind of setting where that message, which is very much part of President Obama, not the totality of President Obama, but part of President Obama, is able to come forth. He, he, that, that seemed to come straight from his soul. I, I was taken by, by how the difference between that kind of discussion and the discussion which inevitably we have in Washington about what you do about these things, which this week wasn't so much about gun rights and gun control as you would think it would be, even though there is a, a debate going on about it, and certainly not about mental health care as you would think it would be. Um, is there any movement that's going to come as a result of this and any of those issues that you've seen signs of, Janet? You know, I don't think so. Um, the, the, the politics and the legislative gridlock on gun issues is, is pretty firmly in place. Uh, this episode, though, kind of raised um, proposals that were a little bit more targeted that you would think might gain some traction, like how about just limiting those, those uh, ammunition clips that allow you to shoot so many bullets so quickly.